there is so much of misconception and misunderstanding and misapprehension that Indian knowledge system is all about only some uh, God and Godheads and some rituals and so on. It's everything is weaved into it. If only we have the patience to go through it, that's why I said we should take one scripture and sit down and properly read it, hear it from properly from someone and then read it, then it opens up a world of possibilities. Every society had problems, every society solved problems. Why do you think everything started after 1500, so this knowledge is all, the rest are all, you know, blind belief and dogmatic and so on. I think that is a mindset which has been given and uh, we need first step out of it. The world of opportunity opens. We have enough material. We need to look at it and look at it seriously. Maybe somebody who is an architect, I want them to look at some of these texts and start reading it. Maybe it's going to make a lot more sense. And we may find some very interesting ideas out of that which will be useful today and take it, move it, move it forward. Very happy to start this two week session on the uh, systems. What I'm going to do is to start with uh, something. I will recite this mantra first. So that's the only way you can read any of these texts. So therefore I have to do it that way only. So let me recite it and then let's start the discussion as to why I brought this. Nasada si no sada si tada ni na si trajo no pio ma paro yate kima bari baku hakas yashar manam bak kima si if I recite like this, which I did today, not just the foreigner, 90% Indians will think there is some Prohi who has come and then some mantra is being recited because some ritual is going on. This is what we generally think. This is the first two mantras from a very famous sutta called Nasadiya Sutta. Nasadasi, that's how it starts. Nasadiya, that's how it is coming. Nasadi, Nasadasi, Nasadasi, right? Na sat asi. There is neither asat, there is na sat. This, if you go on Google Nasati Sutra, a lot of foreigners are actually studying this. Because in eight mantras, there are some ideas on genealogy, origin of the universe. These eight mantras, the Rishi is reflecting what was this? It's today one of the biggest things in scientific uh, conversation. He is the origin of the universe. You know, they say God particle, they say black hole, there are so many things. So these seven, eight mantras are actually speculating on the origin of the universe. Why I am saying is uh, many of these mantras have almost become meaningless to us. Momanta mantra and this is the only way you can recite it. See, I could have simply read it like a prose. That's not what it is a Rig Rig Veda. And there is a swara and there is a way to recite it. So the moment I recite it, people think, here a prohit has come now. So that is the level to which we have distanced ourselves. That is an extent to which we have distanced ourselves. There are these 10,772 mantras that we have in Rig Veda. Covers a wide range of thinking. Whether it is nature, whether it is universe, whether it is psychology, whether it is origin of universe whether it is uh, interpersonal relationship, whether it is climate, whether it is water, there are a variety of topics which are being discussed in these 10,772 mantras. Rig Veda is example. You have, because that is the earliest of the Vedas, I am actually saying that. And so is the case with other Vedas. There are a lot of plenty of ideas. Today all these have, for many of us, otherwise well-read, well-meaning people. I am not casting any aspirations. Otherwise, well-meaning, well-read people have just dumped it. 
dumped it because they think they don't even know what it is. They don't, don't even know what to do with that. So, moment I uttered this mantra and if I kept quiet and I have left it at that without all these explanations, you would have thought here is one more uh, Prohit who has come and then uttered some mantras, he has just rattled some mantras which he knew. That's what we may actually think. There are some very nice ideas which are speculated in this mantra. It's eight mantras. Anyway, so that brings us to the fundamental question. What is this ancient Indian wisdom? And what are some of the hard facts? I have been asking this for the last 20, 25 years. I have asked a variety of people. In a variety of situations, I have asked, what do you think is ancient Indian wisdom? And let me share with you what are the things that I have obtained. Whenever I ask, what is it? You know, you can ask, no? Ask your friend, your next door neighbor, your uh, office friend, your uh, all kinds of, you can ask. What is harm in asking? I have been doing it for the last 20 years probably. And if you ask what he said, I have got several answers. I will just summarize a few of them. They say mythology. See, this word mythology is a very interesting word. Ology means science. Myth and science put together forms the word. Actually, we should delete all these words. We very casually use all these words. They say Ramayana and Mahabharata are Puranas are mythology. Myth means non-existent. Mithya. For this Sanatana Dharma, Ramayana and Mahabharata are not myth. But you know, we keep using these English words because that's what we have been taught in the last hundred years and so. So they say mythology. Mythology. Okay, which means uh, something which is non-existent is so beautifully, you know, talked about. For us, Rama and Krishna exist in this country. For Sanatan Dharma, actually. Anyway, mythology, nothing other than God and religion. So therefore, religious prescriptions. Long list of do's and don'ts. This is another thing I have got. Whenever I ask what is uh, Indianism, I say, oh, they are all Vidhi and Nisheda. Whole lot of do's and, do's and don'ts which suffocates me. Right? Or they say, no, no, these are all matters of blind, blind faith. But I correct such people. Faith is already blind. It doesn't need an adjective blind there. Because the very definition of faith is strict proof is unnecessary. That is called faith. Faith does not, you don't have to add a, you know, adjective blind and all that. Faith is blind. That's the very nature. And faith is very, very important. We will never live otherwise. Very existence is, you know, there is one Shraddha Sukta. Very nice Sukta, it is there. It is, uh, comes, uh, you know, in Ajurveda, I think. Uh, it says, uh, Shraddha Kamasya Mataram. That's what it says. Okay. Sh faith is extremely important. A noble laureate has only faith, nothing else. He doesn't know what he is going to find. He uh, says something interesting is there. Let me just go after it. I mean, finally, when he gets a Nobel Prize, he may give a 20 minutes interview. That's not what the story is. With the long years of faith. Our date of birth is faith. I do not know when I was born. Somebody showed me a piece of paper. And, you know, worthy of, uh, you know, uh, believing parents, we believed. Worthy of believing a doctor, we believed. So, that is called uh, faith. So, they say blind faith, unscientific, etc. These are the kind of things that they say. Then, if you ask, where is it? Suppose we ask, where is this ancient Indian wisdom? That's another question we can ask. Where is it? And I have got again some answers. Well, a lot of them say extinct. That's why, you know, if I utter this mantra and leave it, you all will think some uh, esoteric things is going on here. Right? Or, you know, well, is there a few people are just uh, sort of uh, reciting these mantras and so on. They think it is extinct. Or, they say it is uh, incomprehensible, uninteresting. This is another thing. So, why are we talking about all these? Okay? Or, you know, it is too difficult to call out. No, no, I think it is there, but we don't know where it is. I mean, it's all just out of access. It's simply not uh, even available for us to sort of uh, consumption. So, these kinds of uh, ideas are there about ancient Indian wisdom. And if you ask, why do we need it? This is another question that we can ask. Why do you need it? Right? And again, I have got very interesting uh, answers for it. Let me just share some of them. They say, well, it's all useful for chanting mantras, which is what I also attempted a little bit in the beginning of the lecture today. Just I, attend, I chanted some mantras, right? 
well it is useful for chanting some mantras and for some rituals or nowadays people say saffron agenda this is another way to simply say well uh, you can communalize the society and things like that or people say no no it is uh, all unqualified uh, glorification of the past i don't think we need all that well 2000 years back 3000 years back people would have said something that's okay why are we talking about it now that's all fine we don't really need it because i don't think why do we really have to use it i mean these are all real mental models many of us well educated because we are educated in a certain with a prism so therefore we think like that okay and then they ask uh, are there material gains if i read uh, indian knowledge system will uh, will it feed masses two meals a day then i thumb the desk and say no indian knowledge system cannot feed masses uh, two meals a day and I, in the same speed i tell that a 600 million dollar satellite which uh, in isro launches on the space will not feed uh, masses uh, two meals a day and then i say comma directly it can feed masses indirectly that's what a satellite does you put a insat then it tries to predict the climatic uh, you know weather and all that kind of things because you have accurate weather prediction your cropping pattern can be better your food uh, crop productivity can improve your food production all these can happen na? so in the same way indian knowledge system whether it will feed two uh, meals a day directly no because that's a very low level kind of intervention a higher level intervention requires secondary effects so therefore i agree with them no it doesn't directly maybe indirectly because we need to read we need to get some interesting insight from that apply it and therefore life becomes better we may become happy so many things can happen so will the society be any better all those are indirect effects not direct effects so given this kind of a problem what we actually end up with what do we do with the indian wisdom i am talking about indians leave the foreigners i am now talking about indians foreigners will come i can understand i am talking good number of indians are like this for you know genuinely for reasons that they are not aware of so what happens i find this is how we many of us use indian knowledge wisdom easiest thing is to abandon them because i don't know what it is doesn't make any meaning to me therefore uh, one way is to just or keep it in puja and worship never open it keep a bhagavad gita ramayana every day put uh, to tulasi there that's it don't open and uh, once in a while dust it uh, apply some kumkum and all that and keep it in the puja that's the biggest disservice we can do you should open and read don't keep it in the puja or keep one small book for puja purpose buy another book and read but anyway we think maramayana has to be kept in the puja maybe geeta has to be kept in the puja and things like that so this is another attempt people do keep it in the puja and probably worship it or take positions without knowing what it contains a lot of people say that bhagavad gita is all religious in this and that i have been offering a course 160 students for the last 10 years and i stop it after that because that's only so much i can do and uh, while it certainly has religious perspective it has a lot of interesting perspectives on many things in which can be used in a very gainful way but uh, without knowing that they say in fact the there is no most of the indian knowledge system there isn't any direct reference unless it is a very specifically written as stotra and a god or something otherwise most of the scriptures are very high. because most of these indian knowledge systems uh, uh, core intention is to say how do i make my life happy how do i make meaning to my life that is whether it is ramayana whether it is mahabharata whether it is uh, you know uh, uh, aryabhatiya whether it is uh, grahalagava or whether it is uh, sankhya or darshana anything you take this is the uddesha therefore i will be surprised that it will be less religious and more religious maybe sometime incidental to sort of uh, create a context and so on the core theme has been always how do i find how do i evolve how do i reach that fullness that we which is what i am entitled for but anyway or people glorify the past this is the other problem you know there is one shloka in bhagavad gita matta parataram na anyat kinchidasi dananjaya mai sarvam itam protam sutre maniganaiva so seventh shloka in chapter 7 because there is word sutre maniganaiva 
as though the whole world is weaved in a long thread with different beads of different shapes and colors. Some, some people say, oh, string theory is in Bhagavad Gita because there is one word string. That's the only adjacent. String theory has a lot of uh, mathematics and probability and complex equations and so on. We should never do that. That is disservice to Indian knowledge. And such people can actually, it will better off, they just keep quiet. Because, you know, it only uh, makes it a laughing stock which we are already suspe su suspecting. But that also is another possibility. They glorify the past uh, and, you know, without uh, really getting to understand what it is. Yesterday I alluded to it a little bit during, uh, I was sharing my thoughts. So, therefore, the other possibility that we can think of, which opens a world of possibility, is first of all to get to know it first hand, not second hand or third hand. We can get to know it first hand and having got to know it first hand, it may open up some new paradigms. Unless we go through it, we can't even speculate on it. Unless we know what is in it, how are we going to think of the possibilities of using it. Therefore, this is the other possibility and uh, you know, the current attempt by many of us, government, even the book and that we are writing and all that is may essentially to bring it back to a certain level of first understand what do we have and, you know, assimilate it. Each one of us have our own innate way of understanding that we will bring our own prism, then new ideas will flourish out of it. Therefore, I think that is what even these programs must be intended for. Let us not jump to straight away conclusions and so on. Let us take some scriptures, read it, try to make sense, internalize it and we will come up with a way to understand and use it in a particular way. And that is how this knowledge has anyway been, you know, nourished, developed and put forward for the last 2000-3000 years. We do, we are not, I am not asking anything which uh, we are not used to it. That is the democracy of uh, ideas and knowledge that I talked about yesterday. So that is what it is. So with this preamble, let me give you some quick snippets of what is Indian knowledge system, what it contains historically, what are all the things that we did and so on. And end by saying where are we now and how do we get out of this. So this is broadly what uh, I have in, in mind. Now the first thing that I want to tell you, is there really a value in any ancient wisdom, not just Indian? any ancient wisdom for that matter, then the answer is uh, emphatic yes, because the issue of business, government and society, these are the three constituencies, right? We have government, society and business. Now, what they confront is not something which, uh, you know, opened up only in, uh, you know, 100 years back, as the Western world makes it uh, as to believe. No, I think it is as old as rocks and rivers. Problems existed, there was issue of governance, there was issue of uh, how do you make people happy, how do you make them live uh, secure. You know, in the entire Arthashastra, it says, the, I mean, one of the cardinal things it says is uh, the, the role of a king, the important role of a king is to ensure yoga kshema. Yoga and kshema are two technical words. Yoga and kshema. Yoga means to make an effort to get good things in life and kshema is Whatever you got should not be lost. It should be preserved. So the subjects want yoga kshema. And the king must facilitate that process. Are you telling this problem existed only today, not 2000 years back or 5000 years back? Therefore, I think everybody has thought about it. I mean, in a certain context, they may not have computers and the internet with them. But uh, the problems are there, solutions do exist. So therefore, I think we need to look at those. And uh, the second thing is, uh, you know, it's all created as though there is a lot of thinking has happened in the last 300, 400 years. I mean, that seems to suggest that our ancestors are idiots in some ways. And if you are going by that argument, you will become idiot exactly 200 years from now. Because same logic in any case. If you think, uh, you know, we have suddenly become intelligent and they did not know anything, so therefore we will have to now take problems on our hand and solve it. Now, the same thing will apply to your society also. 300 years later, so we will say a bunch of idiots who lived in 2000 and so on. That's not a very interesting idea. Everybody, God has given cauliflower in everybody's head. I think everybody has an innate ability to think. They have, I think this is a charm of uh, human existence. Therefore, uh, that's another reason why we should understand what they thought. What kind of frameworks they had. What kind of uh, perspectives they took. Because we get something out of it. And... That's the only way we can move it forward. 
not with discontinuity. Thirdly, I talked about it yesterday, path dependence. You know, the path that you walk is only a function of what you walked. If you don't know what is the path on which you have walked, your path uh, ahead is all in serious trouble. So therefore, I think there is enough merit, enough uh, seriousness with which we should look at any ancient Indian wisdom and contextually speaking, here we are talking about Indian knowledge systems. Now, what is this Indian knowledge system? So I will give three definitions, three parts of the definition to put things in place. Indian knowledge system has Indian knowledge and system. So let us understand these three components because that would in a way make what is Indian knowledge system. The first thing is Indian. Indian, by Indian we mean indigenous sources of knowledge generated by the Indian society. And when you say Indian society, it geographically means something, it demographically means something. Geographically, what it means is the Akhanda Bharat. See, this India, Pakistan are all last 75 years, some tweaking of uh, something for some other reasons. When you say Indian, it is Akhanda Bharat. From Kandahar and this side up to Burma, or, you know, a little bit on, uh, you know, Thailand and uh, I mean, uh, 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 on the other side. It is Akhanda Bharat, say to Himalaya. So, that is the meaning of Indian. All other things are not. This is the real meaning of Indian because uh, as you will see, uh, people have been from all these places who have contributed to this, this Jnana uh, Yajna. Demographically speaking, this is very, very important for you to understand. Indian is one who has born and lived here throughout or who have come here and spent substantively integrating with the culture. Anybody other than that, I will not count Indian. You know, a few people who come and then translate Rigveda and go, a few people write commentaries on Shatapata Brahmana and all that. The reason is, unless you live in the society, you don't even know the pulse of the statements and the vocabulary. So you'll end up actually, you know, translating it. You know, there is one Dutch philosopher called Kalanda, who who translated uh, Shatapata Brahmana in 1800, some 53 something, I don't remember the date. So in Shatapata Brahmana, there is one mantra in which it, there is a, it says, Sahasra Gava, Uttara Adara, Sahasra Gava, like that, there is one mantra is coming. Uttara Adara, Uttara Adara means one over the other. Sahasra Gava, it says. So therefore, uh, this gentleman, what he does is, uh, he is, uh, translates it as uh, the earth is moved away from the heavenly bodies by stacking thousand cows one over the other. That's the uh, official translation. So what I am trying to say, Unless we live in the culture, unless we are part of it and understand the nuances of vocabulary and the way it is even used and so on, it won't uh, serve any purpose. So therefore, they have to be here. They have, that is the other part of being Indian. And therefore, there are a lot of travelers' accounts. You know, people who have come here for a few years, done a translation of Rig Veda, have done translation of this work and that work and so on. All those you can generally take it as about IKS rather than IKS. It's very important to make this differentiation. Because sometimes, uh, you know, the access and all that, we say, oh, this is easily available, we'll read it, that's what it is and so on. Therefore, I think we have to be a little mindful of that. So that is the Indian part of it. Then comes the knowledge part of it. As we all know, knowledge is that, uh, you know, knowledge is both tacit and explicit. Knowledge is always tacit. Only then it becomes explicit and there is a deep process of, uh, you know, uh, contemplation, synthesis, all that happens here, right? All that it happens, observation, experimentation, analysis, validation, we had culture of all that. I think every society had its own culture, you know, to just think everything has started in the last 400, 500 years, all these are dogmatic, all these are blind beliefs or very easy positions and a simplistic view of the reality rather than making efforts to understand what it is. But this knowledge can be in a oral form or it can be in the written form. When I say oral form, although, you know, the Vedic literature is uh, uh, Aparusheya and it's all uh, in a oral tradition, what I meant was it was amenable for putting it into a formal, uh, you know, uh, 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 lippy and all that. That's not what I mean by oral form. Oral form is there are a lot of oral traditions, you know, health uh, traditions, 
lot of folk traditions that we use terms like that, uh, music, eating habits, there are a lot of things which are all not uh, in a very uh, written form in any, in, it's all purely on a oral transmission. So, you know, this knowledge can be a formal repository. So, in other words, I can say formal and informal, that is better. Because some of the oral is also in the formal repository now. So, it can be formal and informal and it, it pervades all the three dimensions. Religion, spirituality and well, I can, you know, if you want to use the word secular, but what I mean is a lot of things which can be useful for us to, to say, how do I do a particular thing better? How do I, you know, make it a little more productive? These issues were ever there. It's not that all these issues we confronted only in the last 200, 300 years and therefore we started looking for, uh, you know, ways of doing it. So it can be all that. And by system, of course, is there a way we can structure it, we can organize it so that they are internally consistent and they are comprehensive and exhaustive in, in their own ways. In a way, we can easily understand how one can see one vis-a-vis -vis the other and so on. There are multiple ways all these have been organized uh, in the Indian uh, tradition. So that is what Indian knowledge system is. Let me very quickly uh, put it on a, a simple sort of a representation. So, Indian knowledge system can be literary or formal, whichever way you want to say, or non-literary or informal or oral, whichever way you want to say. So that's, that's one broad level one can understand and look for uh, uh, what Indian knowledge system is. And within literary, you have broadly the vast corpus of uh, things which we can call it as Sanatana Dharma, because they all had allegiance to Anadana Dharma and from there it uh, sort of uh, uh, started flowing down. Therefore, uh, one broad uh, way to look at it is uh, literature and uh, literary repository which uh, are largely one may call it as uh, Sanatana Dharma. And uh, then other dharmic traditions like Bauddha, Jaina, you know, this country has been always uh, uh, been uh, having um, a multitude of flow of thoughts. Therefore, of course, Bauddha and Jaina and even Charvaka and those kinds of things are there. Uh, so, whatever literature uh, have come out of that, that is another possibility. The third is the regional. When I say regional uh, or vernacular, whichever way, I think uh, uh, it has still flown largely out of the Sanatana Dharma traditions, but it has been retold, it has been, uh, you know, emphasized. Uh, sometimes it is a little more... Uh, uh, improvised by some of the local uh, things for the benefit of uh, because we, this country has a rich diversity of languages and uh, dialects and so on. So that is the third which by and large was flowing out of the Sanatana Dharma uh, framework basically. And within that Sanatana Dharma thing we can uh, say core Sanatana dhar Dharmic uh, prescriptions you know you have what is called Chaturdasha Vidyasthana is one way in which one can see the Vedas, the, you know, uh, Darshanas, the uh, Itihasas, etc., etc. All those can be, one we call it as core. And then, of course, there is a very rich literature of uh, uh, thoughts which have come out, which has pervaded into all other, you know, mathematics, astronomy, which in the length, all these uh, in different areas of application, right, uh, which are all also part of that. As I told you, you have the uh, Bauddha and Jaina traditions, uh, which had also had their own uh, basic uh, uh, tenets, uh, important works. Of course, they have done on mathematics and Jaina works in mathematics. You, you know, Buddha, ha Bauddha also has things on mathematics, alchemy, even, you know, your references to ships and shipbuilding in Jataka tales and so on. So I think uh, all these come part of that. As I told you, the regional literature or wealth of, uh, uh, you know, secondary source of uh, knowledge, which all drew from this and then added to it, brought some local issues into it and so on. And of course, we have a very rich oral tradition uh, in terms of art forms and health, food and life practices. I mean, this is uh, something which you can't take it out that easily. I, I keep saying this all the time. In this country, if you travel on the road and every 40-50 kilometers, your, your taste on the tongue will change because the same food is made slightly different. That's the kind of diversity we are talking about. 
you know, you, you go to coastal part of a state, uh, there is a certain way they prepare the food and so on. If you go to the Malanad, I know, if you go to the, uh, you know, uh, hilly areas, they may do something. If you come to the plains, they may do something. Even in the plains, if you go on a hundred kilometers, there are, that's a kind of diversity. The democracy of thought, ideas and options is what characterizes our DNA. So there is no reason for us to just dispose it off and then replace it with a set of how do I even say hi, I have to say in a particular way to write a mail to you, there is a way you have to, you know, dress up, there is a way, you, there is a book you have to read and there is, that's not what it is. Very DNA of this culture is this multiplicity in everything. And that's why Krishna says, ye etam am prapadyante etam stateva bhajami am. Come, whichever way you come, you know, some, for some it may be a much longer road, for some it may be a shorter road, that doesn't matter. Whichever way you come, you come. We will absorb you into the system. So that very DNA is something which we have to hold on to very strongly. And we had a very healthy tradition of differing with one another, but there was a lot of respect. Not to putting down and then call name calling and all kinds of, that's not our culture. You know, if you have six darshanas, they are dis agreed on certain things, disagreed on certain things and they were able to continue the conversation on the basis of, uh, and there was a rigor with which they disagreed, there was a rigor with which uh, there was a uh, prashnotara that happened, all that was our tradition, that in no way stopped something. So that is what we should do when we imbibe this culture, that it should flourish, it should allow possibilities. You should allow various ways, of course, given a certain, I mean, we cannot, you know, do all kinds of nonsense and say we have the possibility. There is a, we need a certain framework in which we should do it, which is fine and which also we have. So that's the kind of a literature that we are talking about. So what I will do is very quickly, I will, I will just sprinkle a sample. By no means this is uh, covering even the tip of the iceberg, so to say. But to just to tell you that we had everything all over uh, thought about at different points in time. So let me very quickly take you through uh, uh, two tables. This is, uh, these dates, first of all, let me tell you these dates are all highly uh, debatable. Instead of uh, spending our time on it because, you know, the in so-called Indologists uh, who are trained uh, with a certain western prism of research and so on, they will come and date uh, some of these uh, works, uh, you know, uh, uh, much later. Whereas uh, our own understanding and Shraddha is there much less. So let us not worry too much about it. Still, for the purpose of some uh, uh, sort of a reference, I have put these. So, you know, you see here, I have just uh, put uh, a few works uh, that you see here, you know. And uh, I had just put a few uh, uh, sort of keywords in the next two columns, not to, uh, for any other reason, but to tell that there are a variety of topics which one can look at, at these, in these works. Because there is this feeling that, you know, it's all about mantras, it's all about some uh, rituals and so on, is something which has pervaded very deeply. So just to you know, tell, not necessarily, uh, because uh, the, in this tradition, and again, it is very understandable. In an oral tradition, you cannot write one book for chemistry, another book for uh, within chemistry, one book for physical chemistry. I mean, today we have been able to, because it's all in a print media, you don't have to commit too much into the memory. So you can uh, get into any level of, uh, you know, uh, dismantling into pieces and uh, elaborately. But in a oral tradition, the name of the game is conciseness. So you should be able to put ideas as concise as possible. So one can expect that in a work you can get mathematics, you can get philosophy, you can get aesthetics, all that should be possible. Because they all were seen as an integral part rather than compartments. Therefore, I am just putting all these, you know, you say Yoga Sutra, you can say we, we can look at the control of mind. You can certainly look at it as a darshana, so there is ideas of philosophy, just to tell you an example. So is Sankhya and so on, right? So Brihat Samhita, which is a very uh, sort of a variety of things which are being discussed on that. Uh, it's a sort of an encyclopedic work in some ways. So I am just, so this is for the period 3000 to 500 CE, just a sort of a sample. And if you take from 500 CE to 1800 CE, 
uh, then one can see I have chosen quite a bit as you see a lot of them are in the area of mathematics and astronomy a few works on uh, you know uh, uh, architecture we got 10th 11th century 12th century there were four or five texts which uh, are in uh, uh, you know vastu shastra and so on uh, so uh, what i am saying is uh, there are a lot of uh, these kind of uh, material available but over and above that there is one more issue i want to really you know flag to you if you say say uh, metal working i'll just show you a few examples now i'll only show you a few examples here and there if you take metal working for instance what you would find because there has been a very substantive oral tradition there was this guru shishya kind of a mechanism with which we sort of uh, uh, cascading therefore much of the nuances of how to do such such level of details are not available in a written format so there is there's a lot of work that we need to pull out now although we are able to understand there are a lot of things have happened some minute details are not available because the oral tradition abruptly stopped i will come to it a little later now what i will do is i will take you through a few examples uh, here and there and uh, so the first thing i will take is uh, metal working and uh, as i just now uh, alluded to if you dig in details we'll have to still see maybe there are so many manuscripts which are yet to be unearthed and so on with whatever available uh, accessible and so on what uh, i think uh, we are able to see is there are enough evidences and indications of a vibrant metal working know how and technology which ought to have been placed although the intricate details we need to really see so let me take you through a few of them look at these two the one that you see on the left is the mauryan steel uh, mauryan seal uh, dated to 332376 ce 4th century you know this first millennia and the one on the right is uh, apparently a, a, a nice ornament made of gold which is there in that uh, museum now if you look at these two just look at these two and uh, if we spend a little time for us to reflect on there will be a multiple technology multiple know hows which are required before you reach here first you should be able to identify ore you should do ore mining you should extract the metal then you should be able to process the metal embossing you know forming uh, you know so many a metallurgist will be able to say that uh, unless all these are in place you will not reach here and uh, you know uh, using metal coins i mean even uh, harappan times we are talking about these seals and so on so what i am saying is the know how of uh, recognizing different metals existing know how of extracting it and putting it to a gainful use and all those have uh, there are enough evidence for us to beyond doubt understand these have been in place you know for example zinc if you take zinc okay zinc uh, india was uh, uh, ahead of everyone in terms of extracting zinc because uh, what i understand is when you melt the ore and when zinc vaporizes at about 500 degree centigrade at about uh, between 500 and 600 500 and 550 you have to extract zinc because if you cross that limit then zinc oxidizes into zinc oxide so now the question is how do you extract zinc in that temperature zone of 500 to 600 degree centigrade so uh, if you look at our text and even some of the you know uh, archaeological evidence the hinduzan zinc has also done work with the iit kanpur and uh, you know university of baroda there are some quite few papers written this shows how the indians came up with what is called a downward drift distillation process basically the idea is common sensically we are able to guess you vaporize it and the vapors come you try to find a way to cool it and extract it out somewhere i think that idea was not to, to be understood much until much later in the western world so this downward drift distillation process which is uh, through which uh, zinc was extracted and uh, no wonder we have a lot of applications of zinc as uh, copper zinc alloys all those are uh, very much uh, taken for granted here for more than 1000 years there is this wood steel this wood steel the name woods came from this wood steel was uh, by and large uh, exported from what our historical records and uh, references that we are able to see this wood steel was uh, manufactured uh, fabricated uh, so to say uh, near uh, erode uh, 
uh, you know that area salem it's in a junction of i would say kerala tamil nadu karnataka that's a way to modern day if you want to say that kind of a region and uh, you know in kannada wood is called uh, steel is called ukku and uh, in tamil it is called urukku so no wonder it's called woods you know <laughs> it's the nearest uh, sort of an uh, pronunciation that you can think of and uh, it looks like uh, the wood steel ingots of wood steel were exported to midwest and the famous uh, damascus blades for warfare you need these beautiful swords you know until this gunpowder and all that came much of the warfare must be with uh, swords and sharp uh, equipment uh, sh you know pieces and so on that wood steel is being exported here and i was actually reading a paper that as uh, as late as sometime in 1960 somewhere they were uh, there were reports that in some of the material science conferences they were still saying the exact uh, composition of wood steel has not been they have not been able to replicate I, i was reading some conference while i was you know looking for so what steel steel india has been very well i mean india's uh, prowess on steel can be understood in more than one ways you know variety of ways we can understand this many of us know this is uh, the so called uh, famous uh, iron pillar uh, in kutub minar which was actually shifted there it was elsewhere and then it was from you know the pradesh was steel there. so iron pillar actually there are so many iron pillars although this uh, have taken uh, a little prominence in terms of visibility you have in madhya pradesh at dar an iron pillar which is twice the weight of this uh, and uh, I, i think there was uh, uh, i think in the last count there are about 77 uh, iron pillars which have been identified there is kollur near shringeri there is one iron pillar kodichelli some one indian sort of science professor has written a paper i was just going over it and what is common to all of them they are not they are rust free they are open to the sky uh, to the uh, they are all not covered in a chamber and kept uh, very carefully somewhere what i am trying to say is uh, there's one at mount abu and even in the temple konark temple you have in um, bhuvaneswar multiple uh, iron beams which are part of the temple so this whole idea of ferrous carbon alloy see the charm of uh, iron is ferrous carbon and you know uh, the uh, if you are a, if you if you do uh, mechanical engineering or metallurgy it is important you read what is called the temperature time transformation diagram and without that you are not and that's the core of the teaching there how these three dimensions uh, influence the mechanical properties of ferrous carbon alloy that's the idea so if you look at these evidences what you find and i'll show you some more I mean, this was from that book which was brought by insa where they have done this kind of uh, research and so on and what is being told is close to about uh, 200 tools i think uh, 100 tools surgical tools were made of carbon alloys apparently as suggested by sushruta and uh, it was suggested that the tools uh, some of the tools were uh, we can actually split a hair longitudinally hair is a micron thickness and if you have to split that long as an example so what it means is whether you split the hair longitudinally is not the issue let us not do hair splitting of that issue but the point is that uh, such uh, sharp tools if you need it actually points to a certain culture of ferrous carbon alloys that is the point and you have granite temples you know pallavas who uh, the big way pioneered the granite temple building granite is the hardest known metal and if you have to chisel that metal you think about the material that you need to even chisel that uh, metal so if you look at our temple architecture if you look at uh, you know these ashokan pillars of stone all these are pointing to perhaps an existence of not only a know how an ability for us to manufacture sharp tools which can work on hardest known material to us so all these point to the superiority of indian tradition on ferrous carbon alloys and there are many more i just sort of and look at this shloka which is from this thing from rasaratna samuchaya which is uh, vagbata's 11th century work right it and uh, what you see here is it says mundam thikshancha kantancha tri prakaram ayah smritam ayan is known broadly into three categories munda and tikshna and kanta that's what it is saying then mrudu kundam kadarancha 
Trividam Munda Muchete. The Munda is of three categories. And they are Mridu, soft and so on. Kuntam and Kataram. Then it says Karam Saram Chahannalam, Hrinnalam, Tara, tha, tara Chattancha Vajiram, Kala Loha Bidhanancha, Shadvidam Thikshna Muchete. So the second category, Thikshna, has six categories now. All these names are there. Then it says Brahmakam Chumbakam Chaiva, Karshakam Dravakam Tata, Evam Chaturvidam Kantam, Roma Kantancha Panchamam. So, the, uh, the, so uh, essentially, these are those categories. There is this uh, Kanta, Tikshna, and Munda. And uh, Kanta is uh, five varieties, Tikshna is six varieties, and uh, uh, you know, uh, the Munda, which is Kasta, and is three varieties. All these uh, in the 11th century, Rasaratna Samuchaya, these uh, descriptions are there, which this work brought it out in a certain amount of detail and so on. So, all these point to an inf and not only a know-how, but an infrastructure to work with metals, right? Ferrous carbon in this particular case, we talked about zinc a little earlier and so on. And look at this idol. And every now and then you will read a newspaper item that either an idol is smuggled or an idol is brought back. This is what uh, we keep reading. And many of them are beautiful 11th century, 7th century to 11th century Chola type of uh, idols. Uh, which are all made of either Panchaloha. Panchaloha is five metals. So that means we knew five metals. We knew how to put it in a certain proportion and cast uh, idols also. Right? So, you know, what you see here is a... And there is a process. It's called Madhu, Madhu Uchishta Vidha. Madhu Uchishta Vidhanam. Okay? Uchishta is left over, right? And Madhu Uchishta is the wax which is left over of the bees. So, you know, in 17th century, there is a French process. Uh, Pierre, some, there is some French name is there, which is equivalent of the last wax casting process. How you can very accurately reproduce the shape of what you have when you want to cast. It's a good casting methodology and we have been doing it for probably 1000, 1200 years, right? All the beautiful idols that you see, particularly in Tamil Nadu temples, which are all being smuggled and are all belong to this category. And they are also made of sometimes, as I told you, five metals. And so therefore, all these are pointing to, you know, whatever is the pattern you need to make, you can do it on that wax and then pour it. When the metal is poured, the wax melts, all those nice uh, methodologies, they have been used. And in Vishnu Dharmavatara Purana, there are, uh, in chapter 3 uh, of the first, second Kanda, uh, there are these details available, uh, as I was reading um, uh, from some sources and to get to know that and so on. So, so much on metal. So, I am saying, well, there is uh, so much, but if you ask uh, the minute details of the engineering details or the... If you get to a greater level of detail, as of now, we are I don't think we are able to lay our hands and part of it could be because there was this whole tradition of the father, son or the guru, sishya, it is typically the family member. This was the charm of caste. I, mean, I should not use the word caste, jati. Caste has no meaning actually, jati. Okay. The idea of a jati was to preserve this know-how. Now, even today you go to Kerala, if you go to a place near Sabarimala, you know, there is a place called Aranmulla. If you go there, they will give you a mirror. The mirror is nothing but metal, polished into mirror. And again, there is only you know, a set of family members who have been maybe slightly larger. So this know-how, in astrologers are like that today to a large extent. Uh, to a large extent, even Ayurvedic practice, you know, there is a Guru Sisha, uh, of course, we are formalizing it, bringing it into Ayush and so on. So, some of these intricate details, uh, greater details are those which we need to now, you know, really find out how to get that. Either they are already in manuscripts which are all buried somewhere or we will have to, you know, replicate it and I do not know which way to go. But there are enough evidence to show that uh, there is... Uh, they had the prowess in working all these areas. Then we'll look at mathematics and astronomy very quickly because we have sessions. I just want to only show you a few things to motivate it to you. So what you see here is a, a construction for a square. And in this construction for a square, you see only circles all over the place because that's how the construction is uh, being uh, sort of uh, uh, established here. 
and uh, all this is part of geometry as we say and in a very elementary school and all that we read and after that uh, except for some of us we don't really put it to a very gainful use and, uh, and, the, and ends there. So imagine how do you get a circle, you can put a stick, maybe tie a thread to it. If you put a stick and tie a thread to it and with that you can create a circle, right? That's a shape that you can very easily create in a very accurate fashion also. Therefore, by if you want to construct any shape, if there is a way by which I can use it, uh, use this methodology of using circles and then through that you generate all the, that is a cyclic geometry that, uh, you know, we, we are talking about to even to generate complex ge geometrical shapes and so on. So we have in one of our Vedanga called Kalpa, in which uh, we have uh, a portion of that called Sulba Sutras. Sulba, Sulba, Sulba is thread actually. So essentially, uh, I am told I was actually uh, uh, googling a little bit to find out. I find in uh, one Canadian university and maybe in one or two American universities, they are teaching it as a, what is called a rope geometry. Apparently, they may be, you know, uh, uh, buying these ideas from some of the Sulba Sutras and uh, perhaps creating uh, uh, a structured way of teaching, you know, geometry as it was practiced. And, you know, we had several reasons why we need geometry. You know, what you see here is a Sena Chiti. It's a altar which is the equivalent of a falcon, flying falcon. Now this cannot be, and there are about, I think, 77 odd uh, different shapes which are prescribed in Kalpa Sutra, the different types of, there is this, uh, you know, like a tortoise. You have, of course, a simple square and a semi-circle. So many, uh, Darsapurna Vedi is of a, a side of a, sort of a two, a, a parabola covered on two sides kind of a thing. So you have to generate all these shapes now. Now, in the, what, is, what you see here is this cannot be done arbitrarily. Apparently, you need 200 bricks, not one more or not one less, and of five different shapes. So, I have just color coded so that it is easy for us to understand what it is. And there is a table which says how many bricks of each of that uh, shape you need in order to make this uh, particular, uh, uh, so you can count exactly this many actually. What you will find is, you will find a 69 of the, you know, the square and, uh, you know, 72 of this uh, right triangle and so on. So, uh, no wonder that uh, there is uh, enough uh, uh, know-how, enough uh, requirement. Everything starts with a certain requirement for us to really make use of uh, these concepts with, uh, and, uh, you know, it's just an example I wanted to show. And uh, what you see here is, uh, again, uh, from... Uh, uh, a, a certain interpretation out of Chandra Shastra, Pingala's Chandra Shastra, which is 2nd century BC, where it is all about, uh, you know, the Ashtaganas, the prosody, uh, the, the, to construct the ar uh, architecture of meters, you, you define the basically eight ganas, the yagana, magana, tagana, and so on. So, uh, to remember that uh, in a very easy, because, you know, everything is oral. So, mnemonics are very much part of the tradition so that uh, certain things, even now we seem to practice a few, many of the traditional things we remember with a simple shloka or a mnemonic and so on. So, what you see here is uh, Yamata Rajabana Salagam, I have written at the bottom. Uh, essentially, in, in the whole, uh, uh, you know, Chandra Shastra, this Lagu and Guru are the two things, right? And uh, Guru, if, if, if you make an equivalence, because there are two now, one can look at it from a perspective of a binary. Because there are only two categories, Lagu and Guru. So if you take Guru as uh, zero and Lagu as one, then uh, one can understand it. So that's how I, uh, I found uh, Professor Ramasaran there. Uh, you know, uh, many of their uh, group of people have actually brought out some of these very interesting. I'm only showing it here to tell you that uh, if you take this Yamata Rajabana Salagam, you say Yamata is actually Lagu, Guru, Guru. So there is a Hraswa and a followed by two Dirgas. I mean, Guru has a few more diamond uh, in this format. So you have one zero zero for that. We take Ma, Ta and Ra, there are three Gurus, so it becomes zero zero zero. So that's how that table you see. So that eight Ganas uh, uh, can be easily remembered by, by this mnemonic. But uh, it is also in modern terms, there is one Debrew in sequence uh, that is being talked about. If you have a binary length of a letter K, you can create what is called a binary cycle. These this eight numbers that you have, 
eight uh, groups of this uh, three digit binary word that you have can be actually derived from this cycle where I have put begin you have 100 zero zero is the first one 000, zero zero is I mean skip one and go to the second like that eight times you can go that is what this mnemonic is saying. Of course, there are many other things uh, in uh, Chandra Shastra which can be mapped on to the binary mathematics. You know, uh, you have Prastara, Nashta, Uddishta and Lagakriya and so on. For example, if you have a 10 digit uh, uh, binary uh, uh, word of length 10, then we have 2 power 10, 512 possible numbers, right, binary representation. So, if you think of an array of 520 will arrange it in a particular way, if you ask me what is the binary letter on the 350 seventh row of that array or if you tell me an uh, array five, you know uh, five, 175th row what is the binary letter so those are all the kind of uh, then uh, what you call as pascal triangle is meru prastara how you construct these binary words of a greater magnitude all those one can deduce from here from you know chandra shastra it has you know enabled us to do all that on astronomy, there are many. Actually, I just quoted to uh, to just tell you that uh, we have had a very long culture of. Uh, see, astronomy is obviously an observational science. I think uh, if one can bring into bearing a deep uh, uh, attitude of observation and uh, relating it to uh, events and what you see. One can, so Indians have been very good and if you read many of these Vedic uh, mantras, there are a lot of, why Vedic mantras, even Ramayana, everywhere there will be a reference of a, a Kartika or a Barani and uh, all these, constantly we have been actually referring to the sky because uh, Jyotisha is one of the Vedanga in any case, you need to know an appropriate time, you need to know the time and do things and so on. So, astronomy has been, been very uh, vibrantly practiced and uh, uh, some of the recent uh, uh, astro uh, scientists and astronomers have been able to uh, relate to what has been done. That's what I have just put it here. You know, these kinds of references give us an idea as to uh, because uh, I find now with uh, some of these software, you know, for example, SkyMap Pro or you know, SkyMap and those kinds of software, one can possibly, uh, you know, plot the night sky. Uh, between uh, let us say 4000 BC to 8000 AD in any part of the world. So, they are now using those to uh, go back to the mantras and even making attempts to uh, even date the mantras and so on. All these are uh, telling us two things. One, maybe those mantras are dated. Secondly, at that time they were able to observe the sky and then relate it to it. There are also other areas that we can actually think about. Now, if you take uh, Bhagavata Purana, Srimad Bhagavata Purana, although we all understand when a moment we say Purana, we certainly have a very religious uh, angle to it because that is what we think. But you know, if you uh, look at the Puranas, Puranas were by their very nature encyclopedic because that was the lens in which everything was shown as to the culture, the practices, the ideas that we need to, it was a vehicle through which, of course, there was a story we, which was uh, the thread under which Srimad Bhagavad Purana is all about Vishnu and Krishna to a large extent and so on. But that no way takes possibility of uh, discussing a lot of things which are useful to us. That is a very spirit of the Puranas in some ways. So, you find, for example, in the the Puranas have these Panchalakshanas. Puranas are not written just like that. They conform to a few things, you know, Vamsa, right, Sarga, right, and then Vamsotra, origin of the universe. There are five of these parameters which are required to actually write, uh, these must be part of Purana. So, if you take uh, Srimad Bhagavata Purana, that the Trithiya Skanda is about origin of the universe. So, there are uh, interesting discussions on time how time can be measured and what are the different units of time. In one chapter, the whole thing is uh, uh, explained in great detail. I was trying to take and start calculating whatever is there. I find in that chapter, there is a description of time from 10 power minus 5 seconds, 3 point something into 10 power minus 5 seconds to 10 power 17 human years. Human year, if you take it as a unit, one year, one year of ourselves living here. 
and take it as a unit 10 power 17 human years which is called Parardha, which is the day time, which is 12 hours of Brahman, not day time is on Parardha and then night time, you know like that. It is all available in that. In Bhagavata Purana, there is also this uh, found in the, again, because it is talking about origin and all that, so many things are discussed. It talks about the fetal development. There are descriptions, you know, I think in Vayu Purana, there is one conversation between Matali, who is the charioteer of Indra and uh, I do not know which Rishi. There also I find, I have read uh, that also, I find there are about 150 shlokas in which the complete description of the fetal development. I found it in that also. Here, anyway, what it says is, uh, you know, first five days, what happens? In the fifth night, uh, the mixture ferments into a bubble. The next ten days, uh, the tenth night, it takes the shape of a plum. Next few days, a uh, lump of flesh. All these are described there. Uh, the first uh, two months, a head is formed in the first month, limbs are formed in the second month and so on. And what I am saying, the point I want to make, is uh, there is so much of misconception and misunderstanding and misapprehension that Indian knowledge system is all about only some uh, god and godheads and some rituals and so on. It's everything is weaved into it. If only we have the patience to go through it. That's why I said we should take one scripture and sit down and properly read it. Hear it from properly from someone and then read it. Then it opens up a world of possibilities. This is from uh, Arthashastra, and Arthashastra, you know, which is about 6500 uh, mantras, if you were called, because they are not in verse form, they are all in paragraphs and statements and so on, but 6500 in all, in which uh, ideas of public administrations are all in place. But in chapter 6, book 6, book 6, first 6.1.1 establishes the elements of a Kautilian state. You take any modern state, it needs seven components. Sapta Prakritayaha. Swami, Amatya, Janapada, Durga, Kosha, Danda, Mitrani, Sapta Prakritayaha. So there are seven Prakritis which are all put here. Swami, which is the king. And then you have the Amatya, which is, uh, which, I mean, there are two connotations of Amatya. One is uh, that you see in Arthashastra when you read it. One is uh, like a kingmaker. The other is uh, Mantri. Mantra is good, I know. So, the council of ministers, secrecy and all that. So, when you talk, look at it as a Amatya, as a council of ministers, then there is a certain number. If it is a kingmaker, there is only, only two or three, that kind of script. So, both mean Amatya. Then you have, of course, Janapada, which is a sort of a territory. And there are good descriptions on how do you develop a land, how do you zone the land, how do you develop a new village. Where do you locate the fort? Where do you what do you do with the port? What is the difference widths of the road that has to be made? Raja Marga must be 56 feet and those 112 feet and those kinds of things. Different types of roads. The road on which an elephant can go. What should be the road on which a chariot goes? You know how a capital city must be designed. Eight dwaras and what kind of roads and intersections. Everything is available, right? Durga represents the fortified capital city where the king, if hard pressed, has to be there for a longer time and so on. Of course, uh, Kosha is the financial part, the treasury part of any thing. You have Danda, our army, which is uh, which has two components. One is the internal security and safety, and it is, uh, other is the protection from the external aggression. Uh, books 3 and 4 talk about it. And when you talk of criminal justice and civil, you know, justice and so on, it uh, cardinally it is rests on the principle of Matsyanyaya, which says the bigger fish should not eat the smaller fish. That is what is emphasized when you talk of the justice systems and so on in Arthashastra. You know, it's interesting to see how it is being expressed in many ways. Then, of course, uh, one of the important idea of uh, Kautilya is territorial expansion, and therefore, uh, how do you take enlarge your territory. So, a good amount of discussion is on that. Book 6 to 13, the five, six books towards the end is all on uh, how circle of kings, uh, how do you, uh, what are the strategies for, uh, you know, uh, all those are there. Take irrigation. I do not know how many of you can uh, uh, look, uh, recognize this. This is the, I think, second oldest 
dam in the world and the only surviving dam in the world of that vintage. This was built in 1st century CE by Karikalan, a Chola king near on the outskirts of Trichy. It is called Kallanai. Kall is stone graphite, Anai is dam actually. So it's called Kallanai actually. Uh, granite, granite, uh, you know, that's what it is. So this was uh, during Sangam period of the Tamil literature, which is 300 BC to 300 CE. Uh, there are a lot of uh, investments on uh, irrigation, watershed management, those kinds of uh, things were there. This is one dam uh, which is uh, still surviving, the Grand Anai Cut. World's oldest still in use, also credited being the fourth oldest dam in the world. All others are not there, this is still living. Of course, in 1800, the, from time to time, they would have strengthened it, obviously, otherwise it might not have survived. So in 1804, some British raised the height of the dam by another 27 inches and so on. You know, in, in the Mauryan system, there is an iron and pine system. In Bihar and all that, I am told, it is still practiced. There is a way by which the water is being, uh, you know, uh, watershed management, if you have to talk about. If you go to Rajasthan and that side, you will find beautiful uh, step wells. It's a very deep step well, which is uh, uh, such an architectural masterpiece. When I went and saw some step wells, absolutely amazing. And in uh, Jodhpur, they will squeeze gypsum and take water and then keep it because the amount of water that falls there is very little. They have mechanisms for uh, water harvesting. Because this is the point I want to make. Every society had problems, every society solved problems. Why do you think everything started after 1500, so this knowledge is all, the rest are all, you know, blind belief and dogmatic and so on. I think that is a mindset which has been given and uh, we need first step out of it. The world of opportunity opens. So, you know, you have uh, all these nice uh, step wells, which depicts uh, some of the finest architecture. It is so aesthetic, utilitarian. All weaved into one. It's so nice. You go and visit, you really be, be stunned by the stepples that you see. I don't know how deep it is. You are able to see how deep it is. Water can see the amount of storage that is possible here, right? Commonly found in Western India because there the water situation is different. You have deserts and scanty rainfalls and so on uh, in the subcontinent, including into the Pakistan and so on. And uh, there is one Gujarat text called Aparajita Pricha, which has details. So, these uh, town planning texts are there, you know, Samarangana Sutra Dara written Bhojpal. The Bhopal is nothing but Bhojpal. King Boja built that city actually. That's why it is Bhojpal. Now you call it as Bhopal. I hope they change it to Bhojpal again. So, uh, you know, he wrote around 11th century Samarangana Sutra Dara. He wrote Mayamatam, which uh, talked about the Dravidian architecture. You have Aparajita Pricha, which is on the western side. So, all over we have enough material. We need to look at it and Look at it seriously. Maybe somebody who is an architect, I want them to look at some of these texts and start reading it. Maybe it's going to make a lot more sense. And we may find some very interesting ideas out of that which will be useful today and take it, move it, move it forward. So these are all just examples. As I told you, it is uh, because it's a trailer session, I only sprinkled a few ideas here and there. But uh, I also want to tell you a few things as to what has happened and what, we, what can we possibly do. I just want to leave some thoughts on that before I call it off. First of all, there is compelling evidence for this. You know, I only what I showed you is only evidence, nothing else. It may be arch, you know, it can be archaeological evidence, or it can be living structures that are there today, or it is literary evidence. All are there. There is compelling evidence to actually show that Indians were very, had a very good understanding of, for example, science and technology and, you know, mathematics, astronomy, kind of things that we were talking about, health and so on. But what is happening is we have no inkling of this today. We have very little awareness of these details, right? And obviously, we do not teach any of them in any of our formal education system, whichever way you look at it. It's all out of our own self-interest. We may have to find a way to read it in our own ways, go to somebody who knows it a little bit more and then pick it up and then have it as a, another profession for us to do. That's what uh, it looks like it is. And uh, some of the science and technology practices which are still in use has been branded as rural or folk practices. So that uh, there is a set of uh, 
tribes in uh, they, they say tribes set of people in Kerala who do uh, certain unique practices that mirror his own example we just dismiss all of them as uh, the other side tribal or you know some folk or something ideally it ought, ought to have been my mainstream thing for us to actually bring it because that maybe they have looked at it in a particular way they have just put it it is like saying pagans and the semitic religions all others who don't be able to just throw it on the other side and say pagans like that so we 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 suffer from a certain terminology terminological framework that's why i said never use the word mythology myth and ology is uh, something which cannot be used for any of the indian puranas or etias because for us it is neither myth in a, and not a science of myth also in any case so i think we had to get out of all these uh, uh, you know terminological cage in which we are stuck today because of the english education and so on indian society relied substantially on the oral tradition that's why a lot of it got lost it was substantially relied on the oral tradition for preservation and dissemination there was a nice uh, family of family of people father son uncle uncle son cousin and that's the real jati they preserved it took it nicely in 1850 you come and then put a stop to it and then chop it off and say this is a bad word let's do something else that means you are just dismantling all these uh, overnight the other thing that we need to understand is uh, the large part of this country were subjected to foreign rule for 700 plus years maybe 1000 years right and uh, that means when the ruling class has no shraddha ruling class came with a very different kind of idea all these will be just uh, you know butchered like anything right you just uh, uh, demolish it uh, unmindfully we have we have been subjected to that and despite all that if you, there is a lot more still with us it only talks about the inherent uh, goodness of this literature and uh, goodness of some people who have at um, against all arts have tried to preserve it in whatever ways they can right so if you burn up a large amount of manuscript right no civilization can actually weather such catastrophic uh, shocks it's very difficult no it is bound to create a certain kind of discontinuity that's what we have also been experiencing in our own ways i mean this is a jerk of a much bigger magnitude right it is a tsunami of uh, you know uh, uh, aggression on knowledge creation in some ways well the priorities of what needs to be increased and in what manner were entirely left to uh, left to the ruling class so they will decide you know i was just reading rajiv malhotra's latest book snakes in the ganga very nice book 850 pages 250 pages he has given references 600 pages he has written 250 pages all kind of very interesting i have read about half the book now uh, you will get a good understanding of some of these things how it is happening i thought uh, they have made a good effort to dig up and give a sense of what it is it was ruling class decides 100 things this is a economic uh, uh, dimension but if a ruling class does it that's much more forceful na they will say all these are not to be done only this is to be done i will close down all these institution if you work here i will give you salary i will create jobs here everything will go that is what uh, created particularly in the last 200 years it got pronounced what happened from the mogal period got even more entrenched and got even more consolidated by 1850 so to speak after the makale and all that it got even more everything fell in place so that you can cut it off the umbilical cord must be cut that's what uh, created this kind of a problem so you know mining ban production tax i mean if karakpur has such a beautiful railway system it is because you have to take all the ore from here and take it out here in the most economic way you have to get uh, mine the mother earth and take it and then convert it into value added and bring it maybe that is the reason why you need a very good rail infrastructure here the coal and the you know iron are all here na so let's create a good infrastructure so don't uh, thump the chest and say britishers are so good they created a nice uh, infrastructure karakpur no there was a reason why they wanted to do it because that's hot uh, at uh, clearly destroyed a lot of our uh, rhythm the rhythm is gone the continuity is gone so that's what it is and uh, uh, certainly a new horizon is emerging and uh, 
in the last 10 15 years there is a lot of uh, uh, effort happening and uh, this book is certainly one small piece in this whole uh, this thing where uh, uh, all these initial things have been brought into a little bit of uh, you know uh, attention hopefully a lot more books sh should come this book should just go to the background and you should have a lot of books which uh, should really come and then we should flood a lot of indian knowledge uh, things uh, that should happen now what can we do very quickly i am running out of time 10 20 very quickly let me tell you what are some of the things that we can do see there are two stories here right one was uh, a us company was awarded a patent for neem as a pesticide and we failed in our efforts to get the us patent dismissed because in simple terms, what is patent? I say I know today, you say you say you know yesterday, then the patent is for you, not for me. In plain English, with a lot of complexities that I am making it. Now, if, if we don't know what our ancestors did, we do not know what they said and went, how are we going to fight a patent war? We will, up, we will be absolutely beaten hands down. So, if not for anything, there is a because the next 100 years is knowledge society not military war the power is a uh, lot of uh, nations power is going to come out of all these patent international you know ipo regulations and so on at least for that reason we must really start reading a chemistry student must read whatever is possible in rasayana shastra and then contribute there a metallurgist must read something on these uh, alchemy and these kinds of things we need to do all that because you know the other story was uh, you know, a patent was granted to turmeric and when Dr. Mashelkar was the director of CSR, 10, 12 years digging up a lot of material, painstakingly finding out what it is and then proving it. And it has become so difficult for us today and we are going to lose a landmine of uh, uh, knowledge. The dabba that I talked about yesterday, we had to open it very quickly and then start uh, you know, understanding what kind of jewels are inside. Otherwise, somebody is going to steal all that and go away. That's one reason why we should read IKS. That's one a, a reason why every one of us must take it as our kartavya. In my area, let me read. I'll pick a text, I will read, take a few years, I'll create an aura of uh, people around me who can also sort of, you know, do things, right? And we, I think this we need to do in order to wait for a government intervention and a policy to do all that. If we believe this country deserves what it is, we have to do it. It is our kartavya. This is a magic square on the left and what you see on the right is called what's called you know pentagonal magic square the difference is in a magic square the rows and the columns add up to the same total the main diagonals add up to the same total it will be 34 whichever way you add here whereas uh, a pentagonal is even more interesting you don't look at it as a matrix like that look at it like a torus like a cylinder imagine it is not a sheet it's a cylinder then there are so many diagonals now, it all depends on what is the next number there, right? It can be curving to the other side, right? So the blue color, if you see in the second, on the right, 13, 16, 4, the number, the other number will be the 1. Because, you know, if you imagine it like a torus, na? So this number will be on that side. So there may be many diagonals now. That is called pan-diagonal magic square. And Indian mathematicians have, you know, solved both the magic square problems and pentagonal magic square problems. Narayana Pandita in 1495 also gave how many, uh, 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 you know, pentagonal magic square you can make out of a 4 by 4. You may ask what is the use of it? I mean, it has a lot of uh, applications actually. Because if, let's say there are 355 possible ways by which you can add up to the number 34. There is a number of 300 and something, 83 or 53, I don't remember. Nayana <laughs> Pandita put which they proved in 1920, uh, they proved that result. Let's say some 300 odd numbers. So, if a number 34 can be obtained in 300 and odd ways, it has a lot of impl implications. For example, if we, this is the proportion of uh, some ingredient which leads to a particular result, then there are now 300 and that many number of possibilities, if there is a proportion in which you can mix certain ingredients to get a certain kind of a, a chemical or something, there are 353 possible. It's a nice uh, combinatorial problem. And you know, I can say if there is a certain combination of skills of different uh, varieties of four varieties, which can lead to a certain kind of a outcome, 
uh, and there are equivalents of and then you can think of again 383. So I think we need to understand these are all not uh, just uh, time pass or fancy applications. They have certainly uh, very deep uh, uh, relevance to us and therefore I think one should go after and understand what was behind all this, how can we you know take it further and those kinds of things is just another example I gave. If you take this Arthashastra, as I was reading Arthashastra, I could 100% map it to a modern business multinational. The Sapta Prakriti that I read in Arthashastra, for me, had a direct relevance. If I have started writing a course outline, I don't know whether I will offer a course outline, but I have, certainly thoughts are emerging in terms of how do we use Arthashastra and teach it in an IAM, some nice, for example, for every one of these, I can give an equivalence of it on the other side. I am able to see a lot of parallels uh, in the discussion that is going on. For example, if you talk of the Amatya, it is equivalent of the board and the CXOs and consultants. So there are some things talked about Amatya now. We can bring it to bearing when you talk of CXOs and you know board uh, members of the board of governors and things of that kind, right? And markets and stakeholders are the equivalent of Janapada that he talked about. So employees, customers, and uh, global partners, channel partners stakeholders and so on. There are again ideas from Janapada, book 2 has an enormous discussion on Janapada details. So one can now start mapping on it and see what kind of new ideas we get. If you talk of strategic barriers, the Durga, the equivalent of it is what is called know-how and patents and those kinds of things which are required for a business. Again, one can dip into it. So like this, you know, if you talk of Danda, the equivalent of it I see is the audit complaints and controls, welfare, accountability, CSR, etc, etc. So what are some of the principles, how have they approached, should we have to look at it and then learn something from there into a modern business corporation. And if you talk of uh, collaborators and uh, mitras, it's all about territorial expansion is nothing but market expansion for a company. So again, one can read those from originally and then bring it into the prism of this. So these kinds of things are waiting. We need to do all these. We can't afford to just, uh, you know, just celebrate it by keeping. That's why I said never keep it in a puja room and then only put flowers and uh, periodically, you know, pipe it with a nice cloth. Again, keep Bhagavad Gita and Ramayana. And don't do that. That's a great disservice. You keep one like that, keep one more for reading also. Both are very important. So I'll stop here by just saying that uh, there are things that we need to do with IKS. We need to fight and win the emerging IPO issues. It's very important. We need to identify specific application areas for immediate implementation. For example, in Brihat Samhita, there is, you know, whenever I, I was reading some of the uh, architecture, Vastastra books, they refer to Brihat Samhita in which there are five uh, humanoids for uh, male and five humanoids for female being the reference. The entire iconography was actually using that, which means the ratio of, you know, length of the, you know, head to width, then length of the head to the lower limb of, these kind of proportions are there. Why can't our uh, textile industry and modern fashion industry make use of it? If you really go and read it, maybe there are some interesting things. If iconography can use it, why can't we use it in, uh, in modern uh, thing in uh, textile and ready-made and all that, we can use it. So like that, we need to identify application area. Only when we read, we can get it. Otherwise, we don't even know what is there. I think we need to do deep studies, specialized areas leading to research. While application is one part of it, I think we need to move this line of thought, draw from there and uh, that move ahead in the path. And I think with all that, we should be able to visualize the new world order from an IK standpoint. This is the agenda for the next 20, 30 years we must do, I think. We don't have to rush it into a few years, 20, 30 years. We should put an agenda like this. IKS is merely a toolbox, but we should know the toolbox. Without knowing what is inside the toolbox, what am I going to do? I should know there is a cutting player, there is a spanner, there is a screw. I should know, no? So let's get to know the toolbox very well in the context of what I am. And then say, let us take the toolbox and see what can we do about it. I think that is what uh, we must do. And I think this program must lead to that. We must have... Uh, that approach to IKS, then things will be better. Thank you. I think I'll stop here. It has a certain uh, implication in, because words create images in the mind. Uh, they are story builders in themselves. So when we say India, we get a certain image. And when we say Bharata, so even when you're saying Indian knowledge systems, of course, that's what we have, um, we are using all the time. But 
Bharat, then I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. No, I while I agree with you that uh, all these sometimes can, um, uh, you know. But a more important thing is uh, uh, one can keep all these aside and get into the heart of what we want to do. I agree with you that uh, sometimes psychologically it uh, gives us a slightly different uh, perspective of things. But I think we have a much deeper and a much immediate problem at hand. Uh, nomenclatures apart, I think we have to dip into it. As long as we know whether we call it as Indian knowledge system or Bharat Jnana Parampara, if we know what is that we are talking about and what uh, we must, uh, we want to do, uh, to me that is far more important. Uh, I, certainly it has a certain uh, effect which we should be very aware of and over times maybe we will have its die hard, I think. So one of the Shastras were, was uh, Sulbha Shastra and the first keyword was mathematics, the second was uh, dharma. So can you just slightly tell us ki how mathematics was connected to uh, dharma of that time? You know, uh, so uh, I think first of all we must understand what dharma is. Dharma of course is a fairly, uh, you know, it's a very multidimensional in nature and therefore uh, you know, it takes different, different uh, forms. So it all depends on which, le from which lens we understood the word dharma, then we will find uh, these two may be very, not necessarily connected very much and so on. I think at a very fundamental level, we need to understand. The word dharma comes from this uh, dhatu dhruhi dharane. All that, it's a very, very fundamental enabler of things. That's why dharma was also emphasized a great deal. Dharma is that which has in, in it an intrinsic attribute to dharane means to support or behold or sustain. In modern terms we talk about sustainability. So I think uh, the cardinal idea of dharma is that with further sustainability. Now sustainability today people for 10-15 years they thought sustainability is only about acid rains and uh, you know climatic and so on. Sustainability is more than that. Now they are saying there is a social sustainability. I think sustainability is a much larger term. It has a lot of things which are to be in rhythm. Satyam, Ritam, all those are to be there. Then the whole thing will be sustainable. So if you take such a broad perspective of that, mathematics will be very much connected to <laughs> Dharma in by any case. I will not see exactly what you said. But in any case, I think uh, why would not? Because uh, anything which... Uh, addresses the cause of a larger uh, loka sangraha and sustainability ought to be dharma. But you know we also take different different dharma means sometimes we think it is do's and don'ts, vidhi and nisheda, sometimes we think it is one's own uh, value system, so many, but all of them will add up to finally the, it should be a very sustainable society, sustainable entity that uh, should keep going, that's a kind of a thing. Sir, hello. <coughs> Sir, uh, the flourish uh, of the Indian knowledge system in the past was uh, done under India's uh, indigenous uh, political system of governance. But do you think the present system of governance can encourage or uh, mobilize, <coughs> mobilize masses to uh, practice Indian knowledge system? Okay, so let us not go to the government. Let us not waste time with them. In fact, in this country, the most interesting that happened in 2014 was that civil society can decide which government will come. You know, one person put a white cap and went and sat in Jantar and Mantar and then one million people started running up and down and then we can change the government. Therefore, I think let's not worry about it. I think as a society, let's... See, I don't need a permission to read Indian knowledge and so, so do you. I think we'll agree on that. If we can, we don't have to be top down, we can be bottom up. Because when the bottom-up approach is much more powerful, as I was giving that example. Therefore, I don't think we should worry too much about it. While we may make efforts on that, but we should not be sitting waiting for one day when all those will be sorted out and I will start reading IK. I think that's not a good idea. Let's not do that at all. Let government do its role. We will put pressure on government by doing what we do. I think that is a lot more sensible approach and that's what we are anyway trying to do. I mean, if it, uh, if it uh, is a little facilitated by the government, well and good. That's all. But that doesn't stop us from doing what we want to do. I think let's not... Uh, because the danger of that is then we will hide behind it and say the government has not had put policies in place. I am not sure whether the government will actually encourage this or not. Those kinds of things will come. Let's waste, not waste time on all that. 
time is uh, very essence of us let us go on it's, thank you for the wonderful deliberation that you've had uh, it's really uh, very much knowledgeable for me but uh, don't you think it's better late than never this approach is better late than never yeah yeah i think uh, you know let government do whatever they want to do you know, like we we could have started much earlier because we are so rich uh, in that so that's not worry that's why i said uh, let us not talk about what has happened only to the extent of sometimes knowing the context we need to i agree with you yes sir you know uh, it's good to start it at any time better late than never yes, that's what let's go on i mean let not worry whether mccallay did that or did this i think there are immaterial no it has all happened rather than talking about it let us talk about it. this is what i call it as never drive a car yes never drive a car looking at the rear view mirror you will dash in no time rear view mirror is about your past look at the windshield and drive the car yes right so therefore anyway so many things have happened in the past let it all be there we should know a little bit of that so that uh, we can be a little alert and know the context of where we are operating beyond that we don't have to yes. let's move look at and then drive the car looking at the road ahead thank you sir uh, in one slide i have seen history of iks sample iks uh, uh, repository uh, there are so many things vedanga jyotish manusmriti etc etc but why sir um, i have one query queries why not brahma sutra included no, no, as they said that that's why i told you it is no way exhaustive it is not even the complete list i just sprinkled a little bit don't think this is exhaustive or this is the list i only wanted to just give you a little sense okay. that uh, if you just take i just put some 20 plus 20 40 uh, exam 20 plus 15 or something okay. is i guess is not 35 of those examples oh. maybe 35 100 or 35000 so let's not worry about that okay. i just put a few of them just to sort of okay so, thank you i think more than Uh, sir if we look from the prism of public administration in the the western jurist uh, masters of jurisprudence they always viewed the state they always viewed the king from the negative light like we must curtail the power of the king we must stop the power of state otherwise state will kill you and sir in india we have concept of dharma shastra we have concept of raj dharma uh, we have seen kings like lord rama also So, sir, what is your take on this? No, no. I think this is, this separates the Western thinking from the Indian thinking. In Artha Shastra, you will find it in book one. You read, you will find it very nicely. The very idea of a king is the subjects look upon king as the descendant of God, as an embodiment of Dharma. He is the you know representative of Dharma, and the king, in turn, looks at the subjects as their own his own children, whatever. so there is a marked difference from the approach that is why all all these come in the way i think uh, the king is and that is why the even if manusmriti if you look at uh, the kind of actions that uh, kings take can land the king in uh, naraka or you know that's are also all related you know kind of what he should do and if he doesn't do the thing rightly he will be in the in the commentary of dharma he or uh, the, the king will be adequately uh, punished for that so the perspective is very different here perspective is king is the direct descendant of god king is supposed to be the embodiment of dharma and the king's role is the yoga kshema of the subjects so when in that approach the lens is very different obviously it has to be different whereas if you look at uh, what you know in business in business management we call it as agency cost it's called principal agent problem see the entire business management works on what is called principal agent pro problem means there is a principal who is the owner and there is a agent who will cheat he is coming only for salary this is called principal agent problem and most of the management literature is on agency cost so there is a agency cost you know whereas if you look at uh, many of our things there is no principal agent problem no look at dabba walas of mumbai they don't have principal agent problem they all are owners they are all they are it's only uh, no rights there are only duties so i think this uh, paradigms are different therefore uh, they ca come out in different ways so today we can look at all that and maybe we'll be in a position to even comment and say what kind of thing that we need to do we have no ideas of any of these from arthashastra uh, 
what were the prescriptions for government in economic sphere? So were there like more free market approaches like minimal government intervention and uh, like low entry barriers or were they actively involved in production? So, uh, uh, well, uh, see, you had also have a timestamp for all these. My own reading of the economics uh, planning and the, all that in Arthashastra, I think uh, uh, state plays a very important role. Private enterprises are around, in fact, very, very interesting. In fact, Arthashastra is not, uh, see, today we are uh, talking, yesterday also I think somebody was asking, I don't know where some other, I don't know. The student was talking to me. See, we are thinking you have to either swing the pendulum to the right or the left. Either free market or government. That's not what it is. In Arthashastra, what you find is there is a lot of encouragement of private enterprises. You find a lot of them. A lot of encouragement of private enterprises is the spirit of what you see there. But you also see a stronger hand of government as an oversight into it. Government control is different from government oversight. That's why we are now, we are also, you know, we say now regulatory, uh, you know, uh, uh, RERA is there, for example, for the construction business, okay. You have a, a regulatory authority even for uh, this thing. So, I think that's a way to go, that it is not swinging the pendulum one way or the other. It is, the question is not whether it should be government control or private enterprise. The question is, what is the ideal composition? That sense you are getting in Arthashastra. It is not uh, swinging just on one side. You see there is encouraging private enterprises, but there are ways by which taxations are introduced, controls are put, oversights are there, punishments are commensurate to deviation from there, all those are also there. I think that would be the kind of governance.